ini tiang ini diikat kawat nah. beginilah caranya supaya jangan darah itu terlalu banyak tahu kan One of the mo the most powerful aspects of film as an art form, and one that is really woefully underexplored, is the way that film, particularly nonfiction film, allows us to make visible the fantasies, the fictions, the stories by which we know ourselves, that make us what we are. You see, most nonfiction film, when people, when we film anything, documentarians or nonfiction filmmakers try to simulate a reality with the people they film in which they pretend they're not present, creating the illusion of a window onto reality. And it is an illusion every single time. In reality, every time you film anybody, they start staging themselves. If I film you for the day, the big event in your day is no longer what you're doing but being filmed by me, and you will stage yourself. And in staging yourself, you will act out the scripts, the fantasies, the half-remembered second-hand, third-rate stories that make you what you are, at least make you how you, that, that, that you, by which you want to be seen. And hiding, those will be hiding some darker insecurities about how you may really see yourself or what you fear you are. And that, in, in that sense, film in its natural form, when you take a camera and film the world, you make visible the stories that make our, uh, the, the fictions, that constitute our facts. It's like a prism for looking at the nature of reality. Certainly the film experience that has most changed my life, and I don't mean to sound in any way arrogant here, is the making of the act of killing, the 10-year journey into the heart of a very human darkness, one which resides in all of us, one in which we are all implicated. I can look back and say, yes, the most important film that I ever saw for me before I started making The Act of Killing was Werner Herzog's Even Dwarfs Started Small, when I discovered that film is a kind of medium, a vehicle for the fever dream, for the collective nightmare, uh, for the collective, um, yeah, the collective phantasmagoria that makes us what we are. But absolutely, the, the, the defining film experience for me, and, and again, I'm so sorry it sounds arrogant, has been spending a decade making The Act of Killing. I'll start with two who are sort of underappreciated, I think. One is Jean Rouche, who actually coined the term cinema verite. Cinema verite uh, has been abused in this country as a term to refer to so-called fly-on-the-wall documentary, where you just uh, pretend you're not present, pretend you're having no profound influence on the events you're, you're filming. But what Jean Rouge did was something much closer to what I've done in The Act of Killing and what I think is, as I said a moment ago, the essence of nonfiction film. He would allow people to stage themselves, to make up stories, to act, make up uh, scripts, make up their own films and act, play themselves in whatever ways they wish. And he did this, he started doing this in the 1950s before there was mo mobile uh, synchronous sound. And he, would play, and he did this in colonial Africa when it was unsafe for people to talk about how their identity had been shaped by the political forces and abuses of colonialism. And they would, he would play this footage back to them and they would dub it. They would create the dialogue in, in, a, screen, in a cinema like this one. And they would say, you know, they, they, would, they would not only make up dialogue that would of course be out of sync, but they would also occasionally break character and say, hey, look, that's me, or you look pretty funny. <laughs> and, and this kind of self-reflexive provocation of reality, in a sense, the camera is always provoking reality. And he wasn't filming on fiction sets. They were going and filming fiction scenes in the world, almost a precursor to reality TV, but without the scripted predictability and formulaic exploited exploitation uh, of people. And, and the, it was instead liberating. And that's what he called cinema verite. He was, again, using cinema as a prism to make visible the fantasies that make up our reality. And that's, it's a great shame that in the United States and in the Anglo and, and in the UK and the Anglo-American world, we have lost the meaning of this term and with it, this whole potential of cinema. And it is 
the most natural. Um, it is the fundamental state of nature, if you like, for nonfiction film, because as I said earlier, whenever you film anybody, they start performing. So performance, collaboration, imagination is the essence of nonfiction cinema, and we've lost that. That's one. So he's, he's perhaps my most important influence in some ways, Jean Rouche. And then I would also say perhaps uh, there's a really a forgotten Danish nonfiction filmmaker, I think is the rightful heir of Altman in, 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 in terms of the rightful successor his work is to Nashville. But he created these documentaries in the 70s and 80s where he let people play themselves, totally scripted, but the people's poor acting, the gap between the performance and what they really are, was the essence, the, 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 the fundamental insight into who they are and into the situations he was filming. His name is Jon Bang Carlsen. His film Hotel of the Stars is an absolute masterpiece, totally forgotten. Um, and then, of course, maybe my, the, third, the third influence that's maybe most dear to me is actually, I'm, I'm grateful to, to call a friend. It's Werner Herzog, whose simple um, wildness inspired me to be wild. And then, I, and then I mustn't forget my real mentor, Dushan Makaveev, whose film Sweet Movie, WR Mysteries of the Organism, Man is Not a Bird, Love Affair, um, and Innocence Unprotected, were the most important and also wild and dreamlike explorations of the space between documentary and fiction before I discovered Jean Rouge. I, I remember exactly when it was, I was 21, 20, I went to university, I went to college to study theoretical physics because I was interested in the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness. But it was a terrible time for kind of metaphysical and epistemological questions in physics, even though that's at the core of quantum mechanics and astronomy. It was terrible because uh, there wasn't yet string theory and there wasn't yet these particle accelerators and the data from the space telescopes wasn't yet really doing much. So everyone was being pushed into engineering. And so then I sort of was lost. I went into philosophy for a while and then I was on a, I, I've always since I was a child loved glaciers, like since, uh, for no clear reason because I didn't grow up in a place where there were glaciers, but I just loved glaciers. Um, I was, I finally got to hike up to a glacier and I, I was in Pakistan actually, um, and I, in the Karakoram Mountains and I went up to this glacier and it was to, I hiked and I hiked and I hiked and I hiked and got to the glacier and it was completely black. It had a layer of rock on it, of gravel. And I was really disappointed, and, but, but I didn't, I, and then I, for some reason, started to cry, but, but not because of the glacier being black. I was thinking about some aspect of my, I don't remember why I was crying. I was all alone. I, I cried. And then I got up and started walking down, and on the way down, I thought, you know, when I go back home to the U.S., I'm going to study film. And, and I don't, I wasn't a cinephile. In fact, my people, you know, I, one thing that really I, I, I always feel kind of inferior about when I hear from other directors is that they all talk about this love of cinema that they had since they were children. I was the youngest in my family, which meant that I was always being taken to movies that were either I couldn't understand because they were too complicated or were just terrifying. My first memories of the cine being in the cinema were absolute horror absolute horror. I remember I was like seven and we went to see Silkwood and Meryl Streep gets like plutonium in her ham sandwich and I don't know what plutonium is so I whisper to my mother and she whispers back. I ask her and she says it's radioactive it's going to give her cancer and she's going to die and I was just so scared and then I, Mad Max what an awful awful film. The, the, uh, Indiana Jones terrible. It's all just it's just so I had no love of cinema, but one day I knew I would be a filmmaker as my way of exploring who we are, what we are, what makes us what we are. And, and I never looked back. Filmmaking is my way of, like, of excavating the world that I live in, of exploring the most troubling, puzzling, mysterious passages in it, the most uh, mysterious aspects of what we are. That's what makes me not just a filmmaker, but a nonfiction filmmaker with the proviso that what I mean by nonfiction, and I use the word to sort of distance myself from a, a sort of self-righteous journalistic tradition that tends to constitute at least particularly American documentaries. Um, I, it's, my, it's my way of exploring the world. I don't, I don't see film as a way of, um, I don't see myself as a storyteller, in fact. I don't see 
film as a as a as as finding a great story. Go, the shooting is going out and getting the material I need to tell the story. The editing is telling the story in the best way. That's not at all how I, I experience it. The way when I make a film, I start with a really strong metaphor, which embodies a kind of vision, usually an apocalyptic but riotous and joyous one, a vision of the world. And then I start with some questions, some methods, some cinematic methods for answering those questions in cinematic terms, a place, a set of characters. So for example, in the act of killing, the metaphor is somehow impunity. And what, what does it mean to live lives predicated on the suffering of others? And or that's the question. The metaphor, the theme is impunity. The question is, what does it mean to live lives predicated on the suffering of others? And somehow the, the, the metaphor is the boasting of these perpetrators of genocide who have won. The place is, of course, northern Sumatra, Indonesia. The characters are the characters in the film. And with a set of methods, I set in motion a process. And that process continues until I'm, so long as the questions are being answered and expanded. And when I'm simply getting more, and no longer getting deeper, it's time to stop. And then it's time to start editing. And the editing is not about telling the story that I discovered in the shooting. The first stage of it is about excavating the layers of meaning in the material that I've shot. So there's a kind of key scene in the act of killing where Anwar plays a victim. The main character plays one of his own victims. And it's shot as a film noir scene. And there's all these layers of meaning in that scene. First of all, he's um, there's a, a man going through a kind of ordeal. There's a victim, sorry, there's a, there's a victim who's being tortured. Then we do a double take as we recognize that the victim is in fact the perpetrator. Then we recognize it's also the perpetrator is going through a psychological ordeal playing the scene. And then we also do this, there's this other level where we become aware this is what it was really like though in the office somehow. And then this final layer where we say, and yet it's all stylized as a film noir gangster scene, which is what influenced him at the time. And all those layers of meaning have to be allowed to breathe and need to be excavated and explored. The material with so many layers is much smarter than I am. And it needs time for, it, I need to give it time for it to speak to me. So the first stage of editing is an excavation. The second stage of editing, I still don't see as storytelling, but as a translation of that experience that I went through shooting for an audience. And to come to the question of what the what audience I imagine I'm, I'm speaking to, above all, it's somehow some kind of imaginary me that knows no but nothing. So it's like I'm making films for people like myself. I assume my audience is as inquisitive and smarter than I am, and no smarter than I am. Uh, as, as, sorry, as inquisitive and as smart as I am, but no smarter than I am, and. Um, with a similar vision of the world, or at least capable of embracing a similar vision of the world, but without all the knowledge that I have, without all the context about the particular uh, space that I've investigated through my film. And I try and translate my experience of shooting and all of the, everything I learned through the editing, the first stage of the editing and the final stage of the editing as I assemble the film, I translate it into an experience for an imaginary, ignorant me who comes to the same place by, at the end, as where I was at the end of the, of the shooting. That's why with the two versions of the act of killing, the longer one and the shorter one, it's not that they're the same, they're not, they're not, it's not the same film. When the film is 40 minutes longer, it does a deeper work. It, that is the film that I hope as a filmmaker takes the viewer, translates for the viewer the experience that I had of shooting the film. And when it's 40 minutes shorter at two hours, it translates part of that experience for the viewer. And the key there is that they are consistent. The two f versions have consistent messages. So fundamentally, I'm making films for, for an imaginary me, and it's my way of exploring our world. You need to somehow have it in you to think in images and sound, and, that's, and to p ask questions in images and sound, and to try and answer those questions in images and sound. That's a kind of cinematic vision. I think you need to have to make work that's lasting, a vision of the world. I think that if you're a documentary maker, your work will not last if it's journalistic and to topical. Your work will last if it expresses a vision of what we are, something universal. Um, I think that you need to have the courage to go into places 
that are profoundly uncomfortable and to stay there and not to flinch. And even when people you care about who you're filming are, are squirming, not to flinch and to be merciless in those situations while also being human and caring and loving for everybody you work with, including your subjects, no matter whether you like them or not. In fact, I think you have to always like your subjects or you can't make a good work about them, even if they've done terrible things. Um, I think you need to have the stamina to keep going when it feels impossible, when it, you, you, you can't give up. And I think you have, the, have to have the self-confidence to ignore everybody who tells you how it should be done. Uh, if, if I listened to the people who told me how it should be done, I would have gotten bored and quit long ago, and certainly my, film, my filmmaking, my cinema, would never have come into existence. Cinema is the, the storytelling medium of modernity. So many of, our, of the stories we all share and that we all have in common are classic works of cinema, but cinema has also been this reflective mirror. The great works of cinema are, are never escapist entertainment. They're always showing some painful aspect of who we are. And if there's a great library in, on, if a great library is a crucial ingredient to a university, so too is a great cinema and with a great program. Um, the, the value of a film program is, is a little less clear for me. You can have a great university that doesn't teach people how to make films. But certainly for me, it, it, the, what was most valuable for me in my film education was just being given, being pushed to develop my curiosity, my wildness, my cinematic, my, my, way, my cinematic uh, vision, my way of thinking through images, and my self-confidence. I think that um, there's too, far too many film programs are concerned with teaching people to be technicians or teaching people to be um, employable producers. Th th that's necessary. People need to be able to work and feed themselves after university. I, I fully accept that. But the, we also have to bear in mind that when we train people to be conventional, they become, they join the ranks of an army of people who contribute to the conventional thinking that prevents us from, and will continue to prevent us from imagining our way uh, to solutions to our biggest problems. So I think that it's fine for film programs to train people to be um, great technicians, directors who can make competent fiction drama, who can make competent documentary. But I think that there should be, the, the, the professors ought to be extremely clear that they're teaching, conf when they, about when they're teaching conformism and not m disguise it as art or creativity. And there should be, more importantly, a space, a preserve, a sanctuary where students are encouraged to develop, to translate their dreams, their nightmares, their most passionate explorations into works for the screen.